بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله الأمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We move on to hadith number 121 and it is a great hadith where the Prophet والسلام, instructed us to read before concluding our prayer. So we went to Tashahud, then we went to As Salat Al Ibrahimiyya. Before offering salam, the Prophet taught us to supplicate. And he also opened the floor for us to ask Allah whatever we want. Therefore, this supplication some scholars went to say that it is mandatory and the majority believe that it is sunnah recommended but it is not mandatory and if you look into the hadith you will find that the prophet is instructing us he says that when you conclude your prayer do this so this is an order and that is why it is most likely that those who said it is mandatory they have the most authentic opinion of all the hadith is Abu Huraira's hadith may Allah be pleased with him and who will read it for us Abu Huraira narrated the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam used to supplicate oh Allah I seek refuge in you from the torment of the grave the torment of the fire, the trial of life and death, and from the trial of the Masi at the Jal, the Antichrist. In another narration of Muslim, when any one of you utters tashahud in prayer, he must seek refuge with Allah from four, and should thus say, O Allah, I seek refuge with you from the torment of the hell, from the torment of the grave, from the trial of life and death, and from the evil of the trial of Masi at the Jal, Antichrist. Okay, now these are the things that the Prophet ﷺ instructed us, ordered us. He must say. The Prophet said, he must say, which is an order. Now, what are these things? First of all, there are a number of narrations. One to say, I seek refuge in you from the torment of hell. And the other one started with, I seek refuge in you from the torment of the grave. So let us begin with the grave. What is the torment of the grave? And do Muslims get torment of the grave? It is the consensus of scholars that people are tormented in their graves. At the beginning, the Prophet ﷺ said that no, those who are being tormented are only the Jews, not the Muslims. The origin of this is when the Prophet ﷺ entered his house and found an old Jew woman and Aisha said O Prophet of Allah this old woman because I did something good for her she said may Allah protect you from the torment of the grave and the Prophet got angry and he said no only the Jews are tormented in their graves and few days later Allah revealed it to him and then he addressed the people and saying, O oh people, seek refuge in Allah from the torment of the grave. Because I was told that the Muslims get tormented in the grave. And we know that among the things that cause the torment of the grave is not protecting yourself when you urinate. As in the case where the Prophet passed by the two graves. You remember we took this. And also, if you spread gossip and namima between the people so that you would make feud and hatred between them. This is also one of the reasons. And there are a number of reasons for torment in the grave. Believers, Muslims, they will be punished in their grave. And this would be a prelude. And this would be like the starters before going on the Day of Judgment. However, sometimes our sins are so little that we may only face our punishment in our graves. 
so that when we come to Allah Azza wa Jal, we would not have any punishment at all. Yet the punishment of the grave is so severe and it's so dangerous that Uthman, may Allah be pleased with him, whenever he stood by a grave, he used to weep until his beard was full of tears. And his companions would say, Uthman, may Allah be pleased with you. We mention hell and we mention fire and you don't cry as much. But when you stand by a grave, this is what happens to you. He says, the grave is the first step to the hereafter. If it's good, then whatever is after it is better. And if it's bad, then whatever is after it is worse. And the Prophet taught us alayhi salatu wasalam what to do in order that Allah would protect us from adab al-qabr, from the torment of the grave. And that is to recite and memorize Surat al-Mulk. The Prophet said alayhi salatu wasalam, there are 30 verses in the Quran if a person memorizes them, if these 30 verses were in a leather container, meaning the body of a believer, Allah would not punish in the grave. That is, تَبَارَكَ الَّذِي بِيَدِهِ الْمُلْكُ وَهُوَ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٌ This chapter, the surah, Surah Al-Mulk, known as Tabarak, but the name is Surah Al-Mulk. So the torment in the grave is severe. We know that the grave is either a hole of hellfire or it is a garden of paradise. May Allah make our graves a garden of paradise. The Prophet then said, alayhi salatu wasalam, and I seek refuge in you, O Allah, from the torment of hellfire. And the torment of hellfire is extreme. We know that the Prophet told us, alayhi salatu wasalam, the least of those who will be punished in hell their punishment would be a stone of fire made or put in their sandals. From its heat, their brains boil. Only a stone of fire. This is the least person to be punished. So, if Allah forgave your fornication, forgave consuming intoxication, forgave you've missed a number of Fajr prayers, in the masjid, forgave you watching something that is haram or listening to something that is haram, but decided to punish you for a cigarette you smoke. Imagine if Allah decided to forgive everything except your smoking. What would the punishment be? A stone made of fire in hell that is put in your sandals your brain boils from it. And you can imagine what happens to the rest of the body. If the brain boils from the heat of the, that stone, then what about the rest of the body? Definitely it's going to be heavily burnt and damaged. And for what? For smoking? And you can convince yourself, I should not watch haram. I should not listen to haram. I should not say haram. I should not eat haram. Because I know that the hell fire is extremely bad and painful to the extent that even the skin once it's burnt Allah changes it as mentioned in the Quran and this is one of the scientific evidences in the Quran that the cells of feeling are in the skin. And whenever the skin is burnt, the body does not feel the pain. And that is why Allah renews the skin on and on and on so that the feeling of pain is continuous. May Allah protect us all. And then the Prophet says, alayhi salatu wasalam, and I seek refuge in you from the trials of life and death. Fitnatu al mahya wal mamat. And what is the trials of life and death? Well, scholars say that the trials of life is what you see in life that tempts you to sin. So the part of the trials of life is money. 
fame, power, knowledge, children, spouses. All of these are trials of life. Why? Imagine your children are part of the trials of life. Your children, your offspring. The Prophet says in the authentic hadith, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that the child is a cause of being stingy, misery. A cause of being a coward, a cause of depression, feeling sad. Why is that? The Prophet says, الْوَلَدُ مَبَخَلَةٌ مَجْبَنَةٌ مَحْزَنَةٌ Why is that? Because even if you have a child, you want to spend in the cause of Allah. Shaitan comes to you and says, if you spend your money in the cause of Allah, your child would probably starve. You would not be able to buy a house. You would not be able to secure his future. So you stop spending for the cause of Allah. And if your child is there and you want to fight for the cause of Allah, you want to defend Islam, Shaitan says, what happens if you die? So you feel coward and you stay. And if your child is a grown-up and he gets sick, you feel sad. If he comes home late, you're worried and sad because you're afraid maybe he had an accident, maybe the police took him, maybe he got into a fight. So your child is always a mean or a cause of being sad. So this is part of the trials of life. Your wife, if she was a righteous, good woman, then you have the best of this life. But if you were not so lucky, then this is part of the trials of life. When you have a nagging woman, when you have a woman that does not wake up for Fajr, or does not wear the hijab, when you have a woman who is always spending your money and asking for more. So this is a big problem. We have a short break. Stay tuned and inshallah we'll continue discussing this beautiful hadith. So don't go away. We are not addicted to dawah. Addiction implies a short-term fix. One doesn't need to get into the zone to talk about Islam. You do dawah because it is a natural result of your commitment to Allah. If you don't talk, people are going to walk. The most effective combination in the propagation of true Islam is found in Dawah Ilallah. Join me, Arib Islam, as we go through Dawah Ilallah only on Peace TV. Follow the tips to make the task of Dawah result oriented in Dawah Ilallah every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday at 10 30 p.m. Saudi Arabia and 11 30 p.m. UAE on Peace TV. Distinguished world famous orator who dedicated their lives to convey the message of peace came together at one platform, the International Islamic Conference, with one vision, with one mission, peace mission. I welcome all of you with Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace Mission, next on Peace TV. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. Part of the trials of life is money. Money, money, money. It changes people, usually to the worse. 
So many people who were poor, who were adequately living, used to pray five times a day in the masjid, used to observe fasting of Mondays and Thursdays, used to also pray night prayer and visit each other and get along, attend classes in the masjid and lectures. The minute Allah gives them money, the minute they become rich, the minute they have cash in their hands, they become arrogant. They miss Fajr prayer, they miss Asr prayer, they don't attend any lectures anymore, they don't think highly of their Imam or of their Sheikh, they buy fancy clothes, fancy cars, and they feel that they are the cream of the society and they're better than anyone else. These are part of the trials of this life. And also poverty. Poverty is part of the trials of life. Once I was rich, everything was made for me. The minute I got poor, I started complaining. Why me? I used to pray five times a day in the masjid. I used to do good things. Why me? Why not him? Why not her? And I started to complain and object to Allah's rulings and decree. This is part of the trials of life. And you can go on and on about this life we're living in. There are so many trials in them. But the Prophet sought Allah's protection from the trials of life and death. So what can be the trials of death? The trials of death are the most frightening. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ said that deeds are judged by their conclusion. إِنَّمَ الْأَعْمَالِ بِالْخَوَاتِيمِ So if you live for 60 or 70 years praying in the masjid, doing well, staying away from haram, and the last day in your life you did something awful. You said, what about if I give it a try, I'd like to go to a nightclub, I like to drink until I'm wasted, I'd like to smoke pot or, you know, do something that I've never done before. And you do it and you die doing it. This is the last thing that you will be judged upon. And that is why it is very scary, the trials of death. Because you never know when death comes to you and that would be your final verdict. Also among the trials of death, those who are prevented from saying the shahada, those who are prevented from saying the kalima. So when they are on their dying bed, so many reports in the books of scholars, people come and say, say la ilaha illallah. And the man instead of saying la ilaha illallah, starts to sing. The last song he heard before he got sick, or the song that was dominating his thinking. They went to someone who deals in usury, in riba. And they told him, say la ilaha illallah. While he was on his dying bed, he said, 10, you pay them back 11. 100, you pay them back 110. All what he's thinking of is his riba, his usury, what he was living for and at. So the trials of death are very scary and we need extremely that we rectify our lives so that when our end comes it comes on something that Allah Azza wa Jal is pleased with and the Prophet goes on to seek Allah's protection and seek Allah's refuge from the trials of al Masih al-Dajjal the Antichrist and we know that the Prophet said there is no trial on earth more severe and dangerous than the trial of al Masih al-Dajjal. Every single messenger of Allah warned his people from al Masih al-Dajjal. And the Prophet gave us a lot of description about him to the extent that we know exactly how it's going to be. Unfortunately, nowadays, we see a lot of people advertising that the Dajjal has been recognized, that the Dajjal has been found, or something like this. And they claim that the Dajjal is the Western media, the Western influence. There are some YouTube 
um, films like The Arrival, and they're all nonsense. They're all rubbish. Some of the brothers told me about it, and I had to spend like half an hour or an hour watching three or four of them. And I sought Allah's forgiveness of the time that I've wasted on such nonsense that has no knowledge at all, claiming that the domes of Dubai and Riyadh and so on, that these are signs calling the Dajjal and that's it, anticipating of him, and these are the Freemasons and the servants and all of this rubbish. Someone who had nothing to do just went on with a camera and took a few shots here and there and made a script and distributed it among the people. And the ignorant people say, yes, he's been identified. He's here. He's there. We know that the Dajjal exists. As in Sahih al-Imam Muslim, we know that Jarir ibn Abdullah al-Bajali saw him in an island and he reported this to the Prophet We know that he's in chains and we know that he will come. But when will he come? After the great battle that takes place between the Muslims and the Christians. And before that battle, they were joint forces against a joint enemy of theirs. Once they defeat that enemy, then feud and fights happen between them and they are victorious. Once they're resting, then the Dajjal comes out. And the Prophet told us exactly what the Dajjal would be doing. He would be spending 40 days only, a day which is equivalent to a year, a day equivalent to a month, a day equivalent to a week. So he would be spending one year and one month and one week and 37 days. So you do the math. It would be one year and two months and few days. This is what he will be spending on earth. But why is it so severe? His trial, the Prophet told us, والسلام, people would come to him with full hearts of Iman and they will believe and become kafir. Every believer would see on his forehead, kafir, disbeliever, whether he, they are literate or illiterate. Allah Azza wa would make them see and recognize him. He would first call himself God and then he would go a little bit down. And the Prophet tells us that he is one-eyed. And he described him to us exactly in all the hadiths are in Sahih Imam Muslim. And he told us when you hear about him, go as far as possible from him. Do not approach him. And he told us that he cannot enter Mecca nor Medina because angels are there waiting for him. And the Prophet told us that he would be so fast, he would cover the whole earth in that period. And he would have control over the rain. And he would call the rain to stop for the people who do not follow him. And those who believe in him, he would call the rain to fall down on them. So much information we have about this Antichrist, so-called Antichrist. And he is not the Antichrist, he's al Masih al Dajjal. We seek Allah's protection from these four things. And we remind ourselves every single prayer before we conclude our prayer, before we offer salam, because the Prophet instructed us والسلام, and pointed out these four things, not because they are there, because of their danger. And we always have to be alert when we deal with these things. This is all the time we have until we meet next time. Fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.